Uh, and we are recording. Welcome, welcome everybody. <laughs> you are now joining um, the Affineur of the Year Meet the Competitors webinar. We have three and me, four competitors, two from the same company tonight. And our your amazing host, Charlie Turnbull, is here by the skin of his teeth. By the skin of my teeth, yes, yes. Good evening, everybody. Um, uh, we're very lucky to have such excellent either affineurs or first-time affineurs or experienced affineurs here to be the first time we're going to be looking at the competitors for the event that concludes on the 27th of April. This is the first affineur of the year competition run by the Academy of Cheese. And although we absolutely think it's a highly competitive event in real terms we're learning as much as we are going along a lot of our competitors and i think they're going to show this are as fascinated about what the outcomes are going to be as we are which is which is really exciting we're taking a cheese that has huge heritage in the uk the cheddar probably our, our most statement cheese certainly the cheese we've got around the world most i'm going to say what can we do with it when mary quick makes this cheese the person who actually brings the cows in milks them gets them through the dairy what she's doing is she's got a commercial business she's trying to make a cheese that's got appeal but our Athena competitors tonight and the ones we're going to be meeting next Tuesday and the week after that, and then for the final on the 27th of April, they've got a free hand. They can do anything they like, and they are experimenting pretty hard. So there's an awful lot of excitement that, about what can be done with one of, you know, one of Britain's statement cheeses. Now, you are coming from lots of different places. We hopefully are going to have a couple of hundred people here joining us tonight, which is really exciting. So put in the chat where you've come from. Tell us about your experience of cheddar. Have you got any weird cheddars that you've come across where the Afano has done something pretty brutal to it and got some interesting results. The good, the bad, the, the, the pretty, the ugly. Let's let's hear all about it. We can see all people. Oh, we've got California. We've got from Paris, Oslo, Norway. Oh, this is so exciting. This is it's international cheese is best. Okay. okay really <laughs> we love out. webinars. So, Texas. <laughs> this is cool. This is cool. Right. Can, um, let's, Charlie, Charlie, can I just stop you? So what yeah. we're going to do is people keep asking your questions in the chat and I'll monitor those and the okay. guys will monitor them and ask them. I'm going to disappear out of the ether because you don't need me. And um, I think we're people are more or less joined, Charlie. So rock and roll, away you go. I want to reach out here. We've got San Antonio, Texas. We've got Hall we've got Halifax, like the Canadian Halifax. We've got somebody in Essex, doesn't sound far away, but they're Malaysian. Um, and South Wales, we know how difficult it is to get South Wales. That's almost like Malaysia. So um, we, we're loving you. Bring, bring your noise, bring your noise. So let me just quickly talk about the event that we've got going on the 27th, because tickets are available. We are meeting, all the competitors will be there. All, all, all 10 cheeses will be there for you to taste. We've also got tasties to see we match in wine, in cider, the cheeses from all the competitors will be on show from other other types of cheeses that we'll be bringing along. Um, and we'll have the original Mary Quick's cheese to compare with. What happens if we'd left the cheese in the store as she did and we're tasting which i was i was lucky enough to taste today um i've been down to the west country to talk to her and find out more about what she does on a normal basis which hopefully will inspire some of our questions tonight um make sure you guys uh are on your toes i've got some very technical stuff coming your way now i'm going to introduce each of the three teams we've got on tonight um one by one hear a little bit about them and then we're going to have a bit of a round table and we're going to talk about what we can find now first up Tim. Now, I know you absolutely love the spotlight. You're the guy who wants to stand in front of a thousand people every night. So I'm sure you're really pleased to be going first. Uh, but let's be honest. You're thrilled, Charlie. You're thrilled. So I'm going to say very little anymore at this point, except you don't think of yourself an affiner, and yet you've got a thousand cheeses sitting in a shed somewhere doing exactly that. Yeah, not a thousand, twelve and a half thousand cheeses we keep at any one time um, because we keep our, our Lincolnshire poacher for about a year and a half typically. So although we're not affineurs in the purest sense, we obviously are maturing our own cheese and we do understand that a little bit. But I, what's interesting for me is I think we know a lot about making our cheese. We've been making cheese just over 30 years now. And I think the production element of it, I think we're really good at, but I think the maturing element, I we know how to mature our cheese, but I don't think we have the breadth of knowledge about what happens. And so I'm intrigued to see a what happens with our cheeses, but also the comparison with others and looking at different situations, how they've how they've treated the cheeses, what the environment is like. I'm, I'm I think it's just a brilliant, brilliant thing. I, I'm so, so, so excited. 
you you've bitten off you've taken two chunks of the cherry here you've got two cheeses you're experimenting with yeah so i've been very naughty and slightly self-serving um what i wanted to do was slightly selfishly i wanted to understand the difference between the traditional cloth bound cheddar which so traditional cheddar is constrained by the history of using cloth bandages and lard to mature their cheese um, as i'm sure most people will know we started making cheese 30 years ago we, we didn't have that constraint we're not making cheddar although our cheese recipe has cheddar elements to it so we use a modern equivalent a, a commercially produced equivalent that's made on the continent and we coat it in this um, breathable um, membrane on the outside it gives this lovely leopard skin um, rind to our cheese and still allows it to breathe but it means it matures slightly differently but quite how differently we don't know so when Mary's cheese arrived um, last last year back in when it was in May last year we kept one cheese it was and then the other one we stripped it of the cloth bandages and we poacherized it so we coated it in our coating so I have a control and then I have our sort of poacher um, coated version if you like and and then we're just monitoring those and watching those and I think it's a very for us quite a simple experiment but I'm fascinating to see and already there are different we haven't tasted the cheese yet I, I don't know what the others have done we haven't tasted ours yet we're waiting to the end but just in terms of the weight of the cheese the look of the cheese the molds that are growing on it are already quite different so, so it, 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 when it, you received your cheese you received it three months as did all the other competitors um, at which point yeah. it comes out of what Mary calls her nursery um, where yes. there's already a coating of molds so they, they, they you're, they're bringing not only the curd but also the mold to your store yes indeed it's slightly worryingly because what we what cheesemakers are paranoid about what cheese maturers are paranoid about is cheese mites and of course those cheeses will already have cheese mites and interestingly Mary's cheese um, the, the the one with the that we kept with the cloth bandages has more cheese mite than than our equivalent. I think the cheese mite seems to like the lard and cloth bandages, um, but yes, definitely it will have brought some of its own flora from her from her dairy. Um, but the I suspect, and you know, we, these are things we can obviously think and talk about. But I suspect most of the flora will come from from our store because obviously it's very seeded. We've had our store for twenty years. There's a lot of mold spores already there and a very natural flora environment already yeah yeah mary's cheese might be amazing in its own way but it's it's outnumbered twelve thousand to two in your store <laughs> yes so, indeed. so there's not a lot there's, there's not a lot she can uh, that they can they do to out compete that because it's one of the things i think we'll come on to is this idea of competitive molds competitive bacteria and how different um uh, temperatures and and humidities encourage different bits to yeah. rise to the front absolutely i mean it Interestingly, we changed the humidity in our store about three months ago for a couple of months for various reasons. And the cheeses had stopped losing weight pretty much completely. And then when we lowered the humidity, we lowered it by about 10%, um, both cheeses started losing weight again. So, it, it, and these are things that really we haven't ever calibrated or do, we don't do lots of experiments like this. So for us, it's fabulous and fascinating. And actually, I'm sure we will end up doing more going forward internally, but also maybe with collaborating with others. Um, because I think it's going to shed a light on a lot of different things. It's going to have, there are going to be more questions than answers, I suspect. So, so you, your takeaway so far, at least yours or belief, is that the affinage is the Cinderella part of cheese production. We put so much attention into the cheese make, those first two, three days, whatever it is, and then we've just hoped that sitting on a store shelf doing its wild thing is, is good enough. I, I can't speak for others, but certainly with our type of cheese um I, my and, and you know there are more experienced cheesemakers who, who you know who make cheese make our style of cheese but i suspect there is a gap in knowledge um a, a breadth of knowledge on on certain issues with affinage I, I imagine if you asked a lot of um cheddar makers they wouldn't be able to answer a lot of the questions that will come up from the discussions that we're going to have over the over the it, over tonight and over the the piece um on the, on the 27th of april well let's turn to perry because perry you are a Hey. You're a techie at heart. I understand from your brief that you've been actually measuring water volumes and stuff with your cheeses. So tell us what, um, start off with yourself and then tell us about what you're planning for this cheese. Yeah, yeah. So I'm Perry from Rennet and Rind. Um, been in the industry for about, coming up to like 10 years, always been a cheese lover. And over the last five years, we've really got into affinage. So I went out to France learned kind of the tools of the trade and then implemented them in our maturing rooms in Papworth. And um, yeah, so, so we kind of really like to measure things, see how things go and work out 
you know, try and look at similar profiles and try and replicate that and make different changes and just experiment a lot, to be perfectly frank with you. And um, yeah, so, so we've been measuring sort of moisture loss. Um, there was a skull that kind of set up as the cheese kind of came in. The first challenge that we had is that actually the, the this is Priscilla, by the way, Charlie. Um, <laughs> you, you made we, yours, we, we haven't, I'm afraid, sorry. Okay, well, I like Priscilla. Uh, I like Queen yeah. of Essex. Pr Pr Priscilla just just screamed to me. I don't know why. Um, but but um, the, the first challenge we had is that our actually our rind was quite malleable. So so we wanted to get that firm up, almost like the best way I can describe it, almost like kind of searing a steak, I suppose. So we dropped the temperature immediately as it came in, really firmed up that rind. And then over the course of May, June, we were hitting it with quite a strong, firm brush to kind of like open up the, the, the covering, the lard on it, and really try and reset, I suppose, what Mary has done in her own rooms. So yeah. although the flora will still be there, you're never gonna go completely, we wanted to give the best chance of our rooms to come through the cheese. So you want the strong to be yours. Yeah, yeah. So a strong brushing, kind of opening that lard up and allowing our flora to just kind of settle in a little bit more. And then gradually, um, so we went from a, a real deep, sharp temperature to firm up the rind and then actually hit it pretty hard for a cheddar, which was probably scared him. But we went from sort of 10 and a half and we've gradually gone down and adjusted the humidity how we wanted it. So we know quicks to be quite a creamy cheese. Same as Tim, I haven't tried the cheese. So I'm only gonna know on the day. Um, so I kind of wanted to extract as much moisture as possible um, and kind of jump a few loops, you know, quite, have an attempt at speeding up the breakdown of fats and really getting some of those complex flavors out and kind of changing the consistency of the texture. So yeah, we, we went from a, a, a low humidity around, you know, in our opinion for a cheddar around about the 80 mark, like in the first couple of months, and then ramped it up. Currently we're sitting around about 93, 94. Wow. And we brought, yeah, I mean, yeah. Let's, 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 let's break it down. There are people watching this going, I have no idea what that means. Okay, so let's talk about, Tim, you've been doing this for many years. What's your typical humidity in your store? Our store typically is 90 to 92 okay. percent. Um, and what that means is when you're standing in that environment, it feels damp. You, you know, yeah. even fully clothed, you know, you're just you're, you can and you can touch the cheeses and yeah. they feel not wet damp, but they you can tell that there is there's a moisture about. So um, we so, typically so go quite high. Um, Mary, but we, Mary sits like around the last, 87. Mary sits okay. around 87. So she's so you are putting more. You're keeping more moisture in the cheese than, than she typically yeah. is. Yeah, well, so, uh, you, but you said yeah, but I think ours loses more moisture because of the because of the rind we use. But we, you know that we can come onto that later. Yeah. So, so James, now you you we've got Tim is doing doing it like donkey's years. Perry's got five years under your belt, and if I've got it right, your version of Priscilla does it have a name? Mute, mute. I mean, um, we don't have a name for it yet because we've actually got three cheeses now. Okay. So uh, okay. We, we've, we've uh, changed the game slightly. Do, do they, do they James doesn't know it. What happened here? James uh, well, doesn't know it, but I've actually named it Frank, short for Frankenstein. Um, and for the, the, those that have seen our uh, Instagram will then instantly understand why. Okay. I think so we we've got Frankenstein. <laughs> Frankenstein's been making friends with another cheese and had baby cheeses or something. How have you got more than one cheese? Did you start with more than one cheese or have you been cutting it up? No, so uh, we took the challenge. We started off um, with the beautiful cheese that we received from Mary. We decided that we would do something slightly unique and add something to the uh, whole microbiome of our little cave that we have. And we palled up with Errington and Angela came down, had lunch with me, and she brought about 10 litres of whey with her as well. So she brought some great uh, sheep's yay, uh, whey, excuse me, and we threw it on the floor, closed the door and said, right, we're gonna leave you in there for a while. We're gonna make sure we've got the right humidity in here, right temperature, just to try and get something um, into, uh, into the rind, et cetera. So we did that for a week or so. And we've kept it uh, turned. Uh, Justin has been the master turner, master of turning for the last uh, few months. And then we took a challenge. We, we thought about this. It's always been the end game for 
what we were going to do at number two was partnering with Graham Kirkham. So I rocked up to Kirkham's the other day with the cheese, checked with Tracy if this was all okay. So we went up there just to get a cut. So we cut the cheese into two discs of one very large piece of the cheddar still, which we buttered. And the other two cheeses we've decided to wash, which is very interesting for such a dense cheese, as you can imagine. Uh -huh. So we've got a coffee milk stout that we've washed on one disc. And the other disc we've uh, uh, worked in with a lovely uh, cider that Perry, you'll be quite pleased with this. It's called Perry. And it's oh, from right. uh, Somerset, two stars, Guild of Fine Foods. So I think the Farrens will be quite pleased with this on that one as well, <laughs> which we've washed over the top of that one. So that's currently in situ. And we're turning that um, each day to see how that rind becomes sticky. Now we're basing that on a cheese that used to be called Brother David, that um, a Graham Kirkham used to make back in the day. I think it was only available for people that lived in and around Goosna near Preston. So we're trying to replicate a similar cheese to that with the Perry and the, the stout version, the coffee milk stout version is something brand new. So we're gonna see how that goes. We started that just over a week ago and we're hoping by the time we get to the uh, grand day that it's gonna be sticky enough and permeated enough to, to have given a different character to the cheese. Because like, um, unlike Tim and Perry, we've actually tasted the cheese on a couple of occasions. And we find that this cheese is very buttery, um, quite mellow, long lasting, a beautiful cheese, but we felt that we could maybe bring that flavor out even more by doing something a bit funky to, of which we've done. We've done with a big piece of cheese, we've buttered it. So we made it, it's, it's a cheddar Lancashire, which is called Frankenstein. So uh, because we've uh, messed around with it a bit. Sorry, can I, can I, okay. So, so you've got this cheese, which is whatever that is, uh, yeah. 14 to 16 inches tall, something of that order. Yeah. And you've gone horizontal to make, did you say two discs or three Two discs, discs? yeah, two, two discs. discs, yeah. Two discs. And one of those discs you've got washed. In Perry, Perry. in cider, but it's called Perry, it's called Perry, Perry cider. cider. Yeah, it's confusing because cider is yeah. Perry isn't cider. Perry's, Perry's is the name of the company, but yeah. there we go. Okay, so I'm already confused. But then the second one, we're within this milk stout. So we've got two different washed rind cheeses, and you're washing exactly. for the last give or take six weeks. That exactly. sort of figure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and I don't want to like pretend you don't know what you're talking about, but um, you really don't know where this is going to go, do you? No, Scooby Doo. We've got absolutely no idea. But all we know is it's going to um, add some interest to this uh, competition over the over the last year we think that we i already know that there's another um a manga who's done something quite brutal it looks amazing with, with their cheese wow. which we'll which we'll which we'll learn about in the next uh okay next we won't we, we, we want people to come back for the next one or the one after that so yeah. so we're not going to give any secrets you will <laughs> find out people by coming back next week what <laughs> it is so brutal we can't even talk about it okay all right, so so we basically um, uh, we've got three brilliantly very different approaches here, or four, five if you've got two from from number two Pound Street, two from Tim and and Perry. Uh, so that's five different cheeses. But let's just step it back a bit. So we have got inside your average cheese, you've got fats, you've got proteins, and you've got some sort of sugar residue, some lactates or some 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 lactic acid residue there. And those traditionally in Mary's store are what we then break down to give us the volatiles and the flavors. Now, for those people who've done their level two or, or, or cheese specialists, you know, we use enzymes to do this and we're launching those enzymes in from a number of corners. We can bring them in through the original milk. They've just stayed there all the way back from the cow. They can come in through the starter or you can introduce them by some sort of um, microorganic process by introducing molds or introducing uh, some sort of bacterial, which might be where James and the number two team are going with that. So, so do you guys have any view about where the main influences are going to be coming from with the flavor of the cheese? Do you think you're going to be able to shift the flavors or do you think Mary's will pronounce? And if you can shift them, what is it that you're doing? That's the sort of the, the, the back biological pathway there. So mm -hmm. Tim, do you want to have a go first on that one? Yeah, I, don't, I think it's re really hard to know. As I say, I'm not experienced in, in affinage other than our own cheese so i'm i'm not entirely sure i mean obviously what james is doing is 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 super interesting and exciting and i think i'm intrigued to know whether such a dense cheese will take those flavors on from the um from what you're you're rubbing the cheeses in and i suspect that will be the biggest difference um you know for for me it's it's, it's about temperature and humidity 
and and that's what I'm what I'm wanting to learn about is the impact of temperature and hum humidity and and the two different coatings that we put on the cheese. Uh, I mean, obviously, if you if you increase the temperature, you can you can move things on more quickly. Reducing temperature slows it down, and the same with the humidity. I I, I suspect is is more humid is going to get more more action and more activity. Certainly, more mold growth. And, and, and we certainly have experienced funky molds on our cheeses. If the humidity gets too high, we get these little pinky, what look like wash grind molds that we don't really want with our cheese. So that's when we have to dial the, the humidity down just to try and get it under control. But I, I, you know, I think it's intriguing. I think that on the day, the, the, that 27th of April is gonna be one of the most exciting cheese days for a long, long time, because it's, it's so collaborative and it's gonna, there's gonna be so many questions and so much to, to look at and think about. I mean, I, I cannot, cannot wait. So Perry, when you're introducing your molds, which let's be honest, come from a number of cheeses, your cheese rooms are full yeah, of yeah. things well beyond cheddar. Do mm -hmm. you think, wh where do you, where do those molds, where do you want those molds to take the flavour and how? Yeah, so I think one specific thing that we did, that there wasn't, there wasn't an around July, like on my notes, July, August, there wasn't too much activity going on. I wanted more. So what we started doing is that we were, we were, what, brushing uh, grape cheeses like uh, uh, Berkswell, which I love the, these types of molds that grow, grow on them, and also brushing Hafon, which have uh, incredible rinds, um, and then brushing Priscilla um, after those brushes to really try and get influences from other cheeses that are actively in our room onto the cheese. And we had a, like a, a big explosion. I don't know if you can kind of see these kind of patches here shortly after in this rusty color mold that kind of came through. Um, and I like it on Halford and I like some of it in Burke's well. I mean, I can try and move that a little bit closer. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it remains to be seen if, that, if that's a big influence. And as we were talking, Charlie, like uh, particularly Tim about temperature and humidity and us going in, reestablishing the rind at a cold temperature, bringing the humidity up really high, trying to get things to accelerate. But in terms of texturally trying to remove quite a lot of moisture at a, a consistent rate, creating that slightly dryness, hopefully, in the cheese, which will create some more complex flavors, hopefully. Yeah, no, I mean, it's such a big cheese. And, you know, any cheddar maker knows, as I'm sure you do, Tim, with your big cheeses, that actually you often get a grading of flavor naturally from the center towards the edge. So, so the, the centers often have a, a buttery, a, a more milky flavor, and, and then you got that dryness towards a sort of more savory, possibly even some bitter notes towards the edge. Um, so you're, you might accelerate that gradient, Perry, by getting the edge to be that much more different, and yet the center might still follow the quick's profile. Yeah, and a second thing that we did, which was quite interesting, was that I felt like, uh, God, around about, it was kind of around about November time, that I felt like our rind was firming up a little bit too much, and and it, it, the moulds were, str I just visually felt that it's just an intuition of doing this for a while, that I felt like that we just needed to break it down a little bit. So where, obviously, Tim almost certainly doesn't want mites in his, in his cheese room, and uh, you've got to combat them. I was trying to instigate them. So I was, uh, uh, there was a period for about two months where I really wanted to break apart that rind a little bit at risk of damaging the cheese and being downgraded for it, I suppose, or whatever the scoring would do. We were using some of our cheeses that uh, are, have a little bit of mite on and using those brushes to impart a little bit of mite on. So just trying to create, like give, our idea is to try and give Priscilla what she needs, you know, give her a lot of love, give her a lot of hands on. Um, and, you know, at the moment we're happy with where she are. Like this is definitely like our molds and our rooms are, you know, visually. Mm -hmm. And we're just now softly brushing her. She likes a little massage, Charlie. Okay. <laughs> I, I can't hear the word Priscilla without thinking of Priscilla, queen of the desert. <laughs> and and uh, so which makes this sort of, Rag pulls cheddar race. I don't know where we're going with this. Uh, but but let's let's turn to James. So so you're you're washing with two different things. Are you wanting a washed rind outcome? Are you trying to encourage bacteria onto the rind, or are you just trying to get the flavors of your wash into the cheese? I think, well, I think in truth, we're not going to with such a hard cheese, a dense cheese, it's gonna be very difficult to um, um make a washed rind cheese at this stage. Um 
we'd love to encourage more uh, brevi backers on the outside to grow to obviously make that happen i don't think it's going to happen i think we're going to be encouraging it to enter the cheese and flavor the cheese that way it's 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 new to me um washing cheeses graham's done it before as well so we had a long conversation over several beers in the morning last week which was exciting um and we decided after tasting all of these great beers that we go for these two the, the coffee stout will be very interesting because it's so dark, it's entering the fissures mm. and the cracks into this cheese, so that it can only influence the flavor of that cheese. If we get some breakdown of, of, of rind, that would be amazing if it becomes quite sticky. We're bringing up the temperature in the room as well to ensure that that is encouraged and being very careful, of course, because of listeria and the environment that we're producing this cheese in as well is, is it has got to be paramount to make this cheese um, what, it, what it should be. So I'd like to think we're gonna get some bee linens on there. We don't know um, because obviously salt, etc. I'd like to, I'd love to see that that cheese comes out with four or five mils of breakdown, which really does influence the flavor of that cheese on a cheddar would be incredible. It's um, going to be a nightmare to hold and pick up. I mean, it's a heavy cheese and now you're making it slippery. Exactly. So we're, yeah, it's going to be interesting bringing that down to London to, uh, to see, <laughs> to make sure we get it there in, in, in one piece. We'll do it. We're, we're not worried. We're James, going to James yeah. how often how often do you wash it? It's washed every day. Every day. You're washing it one, every day. One side, wow. one side, then turned over. One side left, and then turned over. So and it's still not sticky. It's it's it's, it's still fairly yet. firm. It's not sticky yet. Okay. It's still pretty firm. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a bit of there's a bit of slidage going on on the top. So it's, there's something happening. <laughs> But this, the the big cheese that we have, which is the what the the buttered cheddar, this is really interesting for us because we, again we're putting that into. I've been taking that out for walks. I was in I was spoken to four cheddar makers in Somerset. I spoke to George Keane. I spoke to Tom Carver. I spoke to Jamie Montgomery, and I've spoken to the Trithowans about this. And one or two of them suggested take your cheese out for a little walk, literally take it out of the room and stick it in a room that's of a different temperature and see what happens. So I've been doing that for the last week with this, with this cheese. It's been left in our tasting room at a good temperature of 13, 14 degrees to encourage growth on the outside. Because what we want to do is get that beautiful mold on the butter to start to, you know, when you get at Lancashire in your room, when you first got your Lancashire, you have that wonderful smell when you when you have a, a fresh Lancashire, you pick it up. We want to encourage that amazing smell and that so, so that can influence hopefully the taste when you get to try that that cheddar on the day. Um, I'm hoping that a buttery note will, uh, and that mold on the outside will influence the rind slightly in the six and, weeks we've got it. And there's no risk this isn't some West Country humour they're having at your expense and they've got <laughs> some guy with a camera following you as you've got your... <laughs> It sounds like I it. Hope not. <laughs> it, it was all, it was all my of my own volition. Trust me. Uh -huh. <laughs> no cheeses were harmed in the making of this movie. Um, <laughs> yeah, I I I I love the idea because of course temperature is is key. You know, it's the accelerant or it's the it's the it's the redu reducer. You know, you bring it up and and it encourages whole concept of of, of getting different molds or bacteria to compete in a different way and 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 give some other mold the chance to try out its activity on your cheese yeah no it's it's been a, it's been a fascinating journey and uh, i think you, just just we started uh, the day the day the cheese arrived was the day we turned our cave on which is kind of mad we just built a brand new cave we can fit maybe two to three hundred cheeses in there and it was the day it arrived so it's been it's been in pride of place ever since uh, and we've never done affinage before i've always loved cheese i've been in it, we've had our shop for 12 years been in the restaurant business for donkey's years as you know um mm. So this, 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 what better way to no, celebrate I think it's fantastic. and to open up? It's just incredible. So we, we are very proud to be part of this competition. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, you did a great job of, of washing the room in that way. Did you, oh, did you do that? Did you say, yeah, that would kickstart it aggressively? Yeah, well, so Angela just rocked up. I don't know if, if, if you've met Angela before, Perry or Tim, mm -hmm. uh, who is um, who's sister-in-law to, uh, to um, uh, Selena, of course, Selena Cairns. She's complete lunatic. She's great fun. We love it a bit. She said, I've got something for you. I said, what is it? I've got a load of whey for you from me sheep. Throw it on your floor and see what happens. I went, oh shit, really? Do we do that? So we did it. And yeah, it did. It, 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 things happened in there, not just it, on that cheese and other stuff as well. It was great. 
Well, we, you, you will know the, the Graham Kirkham story about when he moved his cheese store across the yard and didn't uh, and he didn't yeah. take his buy in with him. And it, it set back his cheese making by three to six months in a way. And he talks about what he should have done, which is to hose down the new cheese rooms mm -hmm. with whey from the old cheese making process. I didn't know that. So so he talks yeah. about that's the way to get your biome from one place to another. It is it's literally an infectious bucket. Yeah. But in a, in in a good way, in a good way. I think so, I think it it took Graham forever to get that back, to get that uh, the the flora back in his dairy. It's just mm. it's just I mean, but they've made cheese in that tiny little dairy for so long. It's not surprising when you think about it. But you 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 wouldn't believe it would be so difficult to to reintroduce the the microbiome that you need to make the cheese. Given that we're also hygienic and we keep the place clean, yeah. even yeah. so, there's natural flora in in that environment. So I, it doesn't make I any sense. It's are, crazy. There are, there are there are flora in the old dairy of the Kirkham's dairy that have never been measured, named, or, 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 <laughs> or, or analysed. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I mean, of course. Right. But James, you're now carrying that that bacterial load or whatever it is yeah. into your cellar until further notice. It's not just this cheese that's going to be influenced by it. It's you no, know, it's it's in there definitely without shadow of a doubt, um, and it's something that I'd like to encourage. We just have to watch them. And Justin, who works tirelessly inside the cheese cave, uh, managing the cheeses, talking to the cheeses, I'm sure as much as Perry does, um, and maybe mm. massaging them like uh, like Perry massages Priscilla. Yeah. Um, yes, of course. We uh, it's quite interesting when you're talking about the brush, which I think is fascinating as well, Perry. You're using one mm. brush from a particular cheese, and you're taking that cheese that may have had some more more mites and moving that to the to Priscilla and giving that a brush to try and encourage the mite there which is fascinating because we've only got one brush in our so everything's being encouraged by everything that we're rubbing in our in our cave at the moment Justin yeah I'm glad you're rubbing everything that sounds good the okay. the the but let's turn to the mite for a second um <laughs> so when when Mary talks about her growth of her mold so she takes it up to into the main store and then there is a period over which the mite transfer onto the onto the cheeses that are newly arrived and she talks about using the mite to garden the mold right so she wants the mold to be ever present because if they not eaten the mold if the mite isn't even the mold it starts eating the lard and then the cheese which means you get losses so you need to keep the mite on the outside eating eating the mold so she uses her what she calls blowing which is basically a sort of power hose but blows air to remove the mold, sorry, remove the mite, and that she has an air-conditioned space which sucks the mite out. And that's just she represses, but she talks about actively encouraging mite to keep it at that gardener level, a low level of mite to garden the mold. I mean, that sounds a bit like, Perry, what you're sort of aiming to do. Yeah, 100%. And um, you've got to remember, I suppose, Mary's got thousands of cheeses, hasn't she? So I think she uses that blast to, you know, do an efficient job where, you know, we've got the luxury of being hands on with pretty much every cheese. So looking at the cheese and brushing that mite away, and controlling it to that level, you know, and, and it's hard to describe, but the kind of powder that they give off, obviously not making sure it gathers and it's and it's very fine, like a really fine soft dust. That's the only way. Yeah. And, and keeping moves. that control. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, yeah, we've got our microscopes in here and the guys love to, when we see a few of them, put them under and see what they're doing and, uh, and what they're about. But no, you're completely right. You know, you, uh, and so is Mary, you know, of course she is, uh, you know, using that. That's a really great term, like uh, as a gardener, using them to kind of let you know that something's going on and also letting them turn over good good microflora you know so tim the the, the 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 coach that you put on that i use the word plastic coat i don't know if that's like yeah. the, that's like a particular brand or whether that is that is that yeah, a generic name or is that a brand i think it's a it's i think it is a brand uh, um and it, it it gives the cheese a breathable membrane so it's a it's used on cheeses like burkswell and others and it does the job of, of cloth bandages and lard um, but it, dr it dries it out in a slightly different way. So I think we lose a little bit more weight, although the, obviously the proof of the pudding will be in this experiment, but I think we lose it earlier on as well. So I think with the cloth, with the lard, I think it protects the cheese early on. And then when the lard disappears, it starts to dry out more quickly. Whereas with our coating, it's, you're, you're losing quite a lot of weight from the beginning. Um, can the, so, the mite penetrate the, the plastic coat? or can I Yes, so we do. We, we don't get the mite that you would get on traditional West Country cheddar with the cloth bandage and lard. We don't have those tucked wood. We don't have the, the, the challenges that they have, but we do get cheese mites and we do have to keep them under control. At about three or four months, we start to get them and we will hoover 
and rub the cheeses and keep them clean. And if we keep on top of it at that point, then generally it's all okay. But we have had odd, moment, odd parts of our cheese store where we get a bit of an infestation and we have to hit it hard. But gen we, I, we're experienced enough now, that was years ago, um, that we, we keep a lid on it. Um, and I, we, we have no problem with getting cheese mite as long as, as the, as the guys are saying, as long as it's relatively in, in control. It's just when they start to eat into the cheese, yeah. you get the damage in the cheese rather than just on the, on the molds on the outside. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming, James, that cheese mite, they're either in the stout having a party or they haven't turned up. To, where are they? Are they on your cheeses? Uh, well, definitely not where the, where the milk stouts is, that's for sure. Um, and definitely not where the Perry is. That, that they, 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 they've they gone. We've just we literally uncovered them last week, uncovered the cheese last week, cut them. So anything that was present there is now gone and washed in Perry. So having a bang on party for sure. The, la the, the, the cheese that we unwrapped and recovered, we've only partially covered it. So we've taken the top of the cheddar and we've covered that in a, a brand new muslin and we've buttered that with hot butter on the top and around the sides with the retaining the old muslin at the same time. So it'd be quite interesting to see what happens there. Obviously, there were molds that were encouraged along the way um, that we were watching very carefully in the cave. Um, I think it looks very similar to yours, Perry, actually, the way that our molds mm. have developed on the cheese as well, which is quite interesting because when we look at all of the cheeses, that we have done through the academy the pictures that i've seen so far they look very very similar how those molds have developed which is which is quite interesting it, it, it's 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 interesting this this business of, of the, the mite and the and the molds and the, and the competition there um it, it it just seems to be that you, you you're you're trying to maintain control over something you can't see so you don't really and, and also there's often a time delay so you, you do something you don't actually know what's going to happen for, for months down the line so mm. It, it's an awful lot of guessing is going on here. Yeah, there, there, there's so much guesswork. There really is. Um, I think one of the biggest tool is Tim and Perry have touched base on is the temperature control and the humidity and the way that we look after those cheeses in order to encourage or discourage um, the growth of molds, etc. I I um, was panicking with with uh, humidity. I think Justin, you remember we were panicking. Shit, shit, it's gone gone too high, etc. So uh, what do we do? So telephone call here and there to uh, uh, our cheese making friends and open the door. So let it out. So we opened the door. And uh, all of a sudden, we brought down the humidity, and uh, things were things were back to normal again. So yeah, it's it's there's simple simple things you can do to to help those cheeses along for sure. And there's and does the humidity stay fairly consistent, James, in your in your store in your cave? In your no, store? it doesn't, which is really it varies a lot. Really frustrating. I mean, when we first started, um, the room was very consistent, but then when you start to go into the seasons, it, 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 despite where you are. The, if, if you're moving into winter time or moving into summertime, the, the atmosphere changes all around you. So within that biome, it's mm. even changing in there at the same time. So you, you're, you're controlling. It's very difficult, different to, difficult to control the atmosphere. So yeah, you know, the, the, like, like you said, James, actually, this seasonally, this winter was the toughest for humidity. We found we don't know what it was. We've been pretty consistent over the board, but over the winter, it just felt like it was climbing and climbing. And we couldn't yeah, we really... Had the same yeah, it, it, it was hard to work out why that happened, but the, the cheese favoured it. And sometimes it's about, you know, going with the flow and seeing what comes out of it, you know. And um, yeah, it's been quite interesting. Uh, it's been consistent over the years, but yeah, winter was challenging for us on humidity. And, yeah, all, um, I, all I thought was, sir, we're doing something wrong here. We're really doing something wrong here. So I, I rang up uh, Gary Bradshaw, actually, who makes um, Northamptonshire Blue, because he's had some. He, he has had issues with humidity as well. And he said, "Look, just open the doors and get it out." So that's the best way of dealing with it, which we did. Um, yeah, it's 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 a challenge. It is a challenge, but you want to you want to have high humidity. You don't want to have too much moisture in the cheddars as well. You, it, it, yeah. it's. It's, it's no, the, the, the mo too much moisture. I mean, then you're going to have movement in acidity flavors, and that could mask some of the very the hard work you put in getting some of those complex flavors to, to 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 arrive. And then suddenly, it's been steamrolled by too much acidity or something like that. You know, these are subtle. I well, you can like introduce. I think also yeah. with with too much humidity, you can introduce the wrong the wrong molds and the wrong bacteria on your cheese. If the cheeses start to get a little bit damp, and you start to get some of those brevi bacteria on the cheese, which is possible. 
um, you can then start to introduce um, flavors that you may that would be delicious in in some mm. cheeses, but that you're not particularly looking for in, in a cheddar, maybe. Well, it's one of the advantages you guys got of competitors is, is that you're you're not trying to perform to a standard here, right? You mm. are in pure discovery mode. You're not trying to protect a reputation or replace a cheese that a cheese maker, a cheesemonger really wants on their shelf. You you go wild and it works. It's just a win. Yeah. It's a learning, absolutely. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's, re it's really, no, really it's... interesting. What you said, Tim, was as about the, about how Tony Beckett, the bee linens could get on top of the cheese. I think by drying out the cheese slightly, as you said, by no, not allowing it to get too moist and reducing the moisture, will be able to bring out more of the nuances of this great cheese that Mary's made. And that's, I think we've been struggling a little bit with that at number two pound street. So I think now the walk in the park, literally the walk outside warming up, I'm hoping it's not too late to try and get, get more moisture out and allow us to be able to bring out the real true flavor of this immense cheese um, on three different, very different levels. But I think it's very important now. So I'm assuming all three of you would, if you did it again with the same cheese, uh, well, perhaps not, Tim, you've got a very specific agenda there to sort of have a, but you, you would do it differently next time. Um, I suppose maybe it depends how the cheese came in and, and what you wanted to do with it, what it was saying to you. Um, I mean, I think when we talk about like the competition, like you were saying, like, you know, it, it's not in, in a weird way, it's framed as a competition, but it's not one of the such. There's so many variables that happen throughout a year. That you have to respond to and it's just a massive learning experience for everyone to just learn what uh, what other people are doing and just improve and affinage everyone thinks that it's trying to create the best cheese but you're starting with a base which is pretty firm and set what you're trying to do is craft a cheese for a specific person or a profile of cheese that they're going to love so no matter what you know cheese as we always know charlie like cheese is variable it's, it's great it's amazing and then it can be quite bad but there's always someone who loves that kind of batch or that profile if you've got enough customers so you know it, even though it's a competition i know that you know i haven't tasted it yet there'd be people that would love this style of cheese and some that would love james's and some that would love tim so i'm really looking forward to it it's gonna be good fun um, there's a question here from Claire Lewis. Um, is, is, are there any cheeses near your cheeses that you think are affecting, specifically affecting your cheese? Have you got kind of cross-contamination that you think has be, had a particular impact? Um, yeah, well, I moved the location in, in around about November as well in December to, to, to next to the Westcombe to try and get a little bit of mite transference going on um and then yeah that that was it really so that was the main influence for, for priscilla as her own place and that's that, that that's her her own chamber of rest um but yeah she she spent a couple of months with the uh, westcombe uh, guys um bit of a floozy um and uh, yeah got a little bit of my on there and then she was back in a back in her room mm. Frank frankenstein's been hanging out with tom as well to be fair uh five tom oh, um so uh, he's been on the same shelf. So we're going to have a similar microbiome on the outside of the. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got I had five fresh, um, about two three month old ones as well. It's pretty much the same time that came in as Mary's did. So they're aging in the same sort of profile as, um, but without being um, without being cut and washed. We'll find out. And yeah. if we, we come across flavor profiles, we go that has echoes of another cheese. Maybe we'll we'll know that. But you're not seeing any, you know, so sort of geotrichum or, or or anything that's shouldn't yeah you know, would be really quite a departure appearing on your cheeses. Um, I, I had a, a short little spell of some, you know, it was a derivative of, you know, penicillium that, that, that arrived in this winter period that we're talking about, this humidity. And I wanted that out immediately. You know, bloomy rinds always resonate with me being mushroomy and I did not want that flavour anywhere near this cheese. So, um, so we did some kind of firm uh, removing of that, changed a few things up for a little while and, and, and got rid of it. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's the one thing that I didn't want near it. And, um, yeah, and it doesn't appear to be there. I mean, if we're looking, I, I think we managed to get some of the, the spore and Dima, the red mold that, that, that's on cheese, you know, I, I, I did try, cause I do love 
uh, Chrysosporium, which is kind of um, on a lot of um, Rachel style cheeses. Um, yeah, sheep cheeses. Steady. Oh, now yep. bring that back. Bring that back. Yep, yep, yep. So that's yeah. So so um, we, so we that's kind sort of. It's almost yeah, like so a sort just, of prim, a primrose of a, of a of a mold. Yeah, yeah. So just a, a yellow mold, which I, visually, flavor-wise, not too much. But you, you know, um, in terms of visually, I think it's quite striking. But it's commonly found on sheep's milk cheeses and uh or go um and yeah it didn't take to the cheese but i was hoping that it would for a, but, but, it, but it didn't so um so yeah so i think we have some of the red molds that are in there maybe um spore and diva um but yeah on the whole really happy with it cool cool all right so we're a part of the academy of cheese level level three and four which will be launching over the next sort of 24 months there is an affinar course it's being um uh done by ruth at fine cheese course a uh, fine cheese um fine cheese co which is one of the reasons she's not em uh, she's not entered this year but she's very keen to have a go so there's going to be an affinar program if you were to you know using your experience for the last few months what would be your one thing you'd, you'd really need to see in that course what was what's the most the biggest learning for you Um, so, so, so I'll, I'll go. I think the biggest thing is record keeping. Now that sounds so boring, right? You know, bit, we're yeah. talking about, oh, yeah, admittedly so. But I mean, if you find a pro profile of cheese and you've got, you know, perfectly mapped out humidity, temperature, your, what, what you're turning, uh, mm. moisture loss, if you visually can imprint that in your memory, and then give that cheese, which you, you know what it needs, or use that collective records to bring together. I think you have a better chance of running a successful maturing room. So I think the record keeping, like in that course, I think it's just really key. It's about being able to do it again. Yeah, do do it again, but also <laughs> in a very odd way, do a hybrid. You know, so so if your cheese is doing something. You can refer back in your records and say, well, at this point, I reduced the humidity. At this point, I raised it. At this point, I did this. And choosing that pathway for the ease mm. to, to go down. Um, mm. And I think that's really important. What about you, James and Justin? Well, I, I mean, Justin, over to you. You, 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 you haven't spoken much. No, well, um, yeah, I think it's kind of getting to grips of knowing what cheese you're, you're aging as well. Um, I think we're in the, the very fortunate, certainly for me, I'm coming up, the end of this month is um, me being a cheesemonger for a year. So for as a, a very, very unexperienced affiner in, in that tense, learning from James, I think it's all about knowing um, what cheese you're aging. Um, and like Perry said, I think it, that is the, the, the main key, the details, the record keeping, how it changes, watching that cheese change on a monthly basis, watching that growth, just making notes, and then going on forward when you are maturing other cheeses, you can then use that as a reference from how your cheeses are changing. So, so at the risk of using a golfing method, it, it's not keeping it on the fairway, it's knowing what happens when it goes in the rough kind of thing, exactly. being prepared, yeah. paying attention and knowing what action to take to bring it back because there's so much microbiological activity that you can't know all the time what's going on, but you've got to be ready for when you need to correct for it. Yeah, I think um, if, if I may, Charlie, I think going on, I think the Afinor, uh, Afinor course is amazing. So well done everybody for uh, getting this up and running. Um, certainly I'll be wanting to jump onto that course straight away. I think, um, one thing I would like to learn more about um, to become more proficient at aging cheeses is learning the mastery of humidity um, and temperature control in the caves and learning to get to grips with how that stimulates certain bacteria and others it doesn't. So what temperatures we use to encourage certain bacteria on certain cheeses how we uh, make a washed rind cheese really happen. Um, I, I've certainly spent some great time at Neil's Yard Dairy with uh, Serge and Bronwyn, had a look around their, their aging rooms um, and seen the different temperatures and humidities they have in these rooms, which is completely fascinating. And, and they know exactly what they're doing there, of course, as well. So to be able to really bring that into the course uh, would, would be fabulous for us as well. Well, they, they're probably the most 
for lack of a better word, mature ethanols in the it, it, within the UK brood right now. I mean, obviously yeah. we've got Mons represented in the UK, but they're sort of um, you know they're bringing their experience from abroad. From from homegrown ethanols perspective, I would probably say Neil's Yard have got yeah. the most under their belts. Yeah, it's so exciting looking at what they're doing. They've got such diversity as well in what they in what they mature. I mean, people like Tim, very huge, powerful knowledge about your tea, cheeses, Tim, and then it falls away when you start talking about anything else. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, no, no. We do something very specific. I mean, my, my one thought about the Affineur course would be experimenting and recording as well. So I think to encourage experimenting, because that's how you learn. And I think with coupled with Perry's advice about, about recording, I think that's the key thing for me. Well, that's 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 very romantic of everyone. We've got to keep good records. That's you know <laughs> taking it away. Okay, so we're coming towards the end now. I've got to say thank you so much, you guys, for really delivering on you know the creativity that we were hoping for and being so collaborative and working with each other and and sharing and sharing this 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 concept of it's about learning together. We've got very little experience in this country outside specific cheeses of what affinery means and and we're now breaking that ground and becoming the experts we are in cheese making which i think is a, a fair way of looking at the british renaissance right now so yeah, thanks for having us it's been a pleasure so let's uh let's talk about quickly recapture when we're going to see you guys again uh we've got two more weeks of the meet the competitors uh which is coming up in the in the next two weeks and then we three uh, teams will meet in in april 27th Tracy, do you want to make sure I've got all my facts right? Who have we got judging? Oh, I've got oh, Martha Collinson. We've got Ruth from Fine Cheese Company. We've got um, Noemi Richard, who's French. So she's got a lot of a lot of experience in judging and, and working with French uh, cheeses. We have got Matt Abe, who is the exec chef from uh, Gordon Ramsay Group. We've got John Lilly. We have got, I'm missing one, Patrick McGuigan, everybody's uh, favourite cheese journalist. <laughs> and, and Mary is going to chair it. She's not getting a vote, but she's sort of corralling them to make sure that they give good time to each cheese, which is going to be very exciting. We have got one last question, guys. I've, we've, to be honest, you've been really, really good because we've had a few questions through the evening, but you've kind of answered them as as you were talking, so I haven't got to come up with too many for you, but there's one here and I don't know who wants to answer it. Does air pressure, i.e. above sea level in the maturation room, affect maturation? <laughs> Whoa. I live near the sea and it's very humid, so. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess I understand. Yeah, yeah, go I, I, yeah, go on, Perry. No, I suppose if you're talking about sort of, uh, I suppose above sea level mountain ranges and things like that. I think there's been some science recently which cheese is usually sweeter when it's matured up in the mountains, or if that's what we're talking. Are we talking about vicinity to the sea? Um, and in terms of air pressure, um, you know, it's important to have negative air pressure in your maturing room. So if anything nasty just kind of gets sucked out, I suppose. Um, so yeah, they're, 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 that's uh, does that answer the question? Anyone else? Just one, one little thing, quite funny. Um, monasteries, islands. Uh, I think maybe Charlie, you told me this. One of you, one of you taught, taught me this, which I thought was completely fascinating. How the sea influences some Irish cheeses back in the day. Monks making cutting curds, sweating into the curd. Cheeses being made, put on the side by the window where there was no glass, sea air coming in, washing those cheeses naturally. Brevi Bacchus linen, uh, happy days, washed rind cheeses. That's how the sea air affected the cheese and that orange mold uh, came to be. One of the stories, which is yeah. quite interesting. Um, <laughs> it's, it's definitely true that if you look at some of the Italian, well, more amongst the sort of the cured hams, those kind of things, they make a lot of where they're hams are cured whether it's near the sea and the breezes coming down off the mountains they san daniele for instance uh, has yeah. a lot of alpine influences whereas the parma mm -hmm. ham is a lot more mediterranean so so there's probably something in it but um as we've covered many times tonight so much is invisible which which are the important influences 
what temperature, humidity, time, turning, washing, brushing, turning. We're going to find out. We're going to find oh, okay. out. On the 20th, 27th of April. <laughs> you guys have got to put. You've got to, <laughs> you've got to get out your cheese irons and put your put your cheese where your mouth is. And all those lucky people who are going to be there on the day are going to be able to taste all these cheeses along with tasting them with different and and Mary's original. Um, and so we really hope that it's going to be a fantastic event. Get in touch with Tracy if you have any trouble booking your spot. She will always find a way. Um, and we've got tasting with we've got we've got Druv. So we've got his 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 um, charcuterie there okay. being done. Um, it's going to be a real event, and there's going to be a lot to chat about. I did see one question about when are we giving the results out. We're going to try and have a live event on the day, but we're going to prioritize the people in the room. But we will definitely get the results on social media and through a webinar as soon as we can. And the cheese is on sale as well, isn't it? Sure. Yeah. So we're anybody who comes to the event on the night will have um, obviously get to taste the cheese as part of coming to the event on the afternoon. Uh, results are going to be announced about 5 p.m. Um, we're hoping the judge will be done by then. There might be a lot, a lot of discussion might go a bit over. Um, and you guys will have the rest of your cheeses to either sell on the, at the event or online or in your stores, in your shops. So they're your cheeses. You can do what you like with them, which is amazing. It is really interesting, I think, that we will have the original cheese from Mary, from Quix, there on the, on the day as well. So everybody will be able to compare to a traditional cheese that's matured in the Quicks maturing rooms. Perfect. Tracy, is there watch. going to be a bar? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Perry, Perry, Drub's going to be there, of course. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. Okay. So what we've got, we've got sharp and it's, it's it's cool. We've got sharp and wines are coming, and they're going to do our our welcome drink, and they're going to be there sampling their other wines. And then we've got a beer supplier and a cider supplier coming, artisan, of course, um, to sample their wares and drew with the charcuterie. There'll be plenty of bread and water and apples and joy and merriment because we'll all be back excellent. together again. And a excellent Stunning. company. Yes. And all, all profit from my cheese is going to all profit from the big cheese at number two, the three. Any profit is going to Ukraine. Oh, that's fantastic, James. Oh. Yes. Tracy, why didn't we think of that? That's a really good one. Cool. <laughs> okay. Well, um, um, are, we, are we wrapping up? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you to all of you. Amazing uh, to share your knowledge about this one aspect of affinage. Thank you, Charlie, for hosting. And we will see you same time next week, Charlie. Mm -hmm. You. Well, we'll meet. Um, in, we, 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 we know Brindis is going to be there and they're, they're covering their cheese in paprika. So it just gets cooler and weirder. Be here next week when we will absolutely reveal more secrets from the greatest affineurs the UK has to offer. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye. See you, guys. Bye, Bye now. Back, See you in a couple of weeks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.